Hello and welcome to KPN Artwaves 2022 season. My name is Jacqueline Ganim DeFalco. Artwaves is a member program of 1623 Studios here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We kicked off our program in March of 2020. Artwaves delves into the working lives of our local artists here in Cape Ann. And I co-host and co-produce the show with Christine Fisher. We're excited to announce that Artways has received nearly 12,000 views on YouTube since we began, and we've interviewed over 60 artists. Cape Ann Artways is made possible by our generous sponsors, Prince Insurance Agency, M. Christine Fisher, Visual Artist, Compass Realty and Martha Anger, Real Estate Advisor, Protective Packaging Inc., and the Common Crow Natural Market, and their newest sponsor is Cape Ann Savings Bank. We'd also like to recognize Steve Lacey and Pat Verga, who provided us with original music for the show, and our partner, 1623 Studios, and also Sea Arts, who we're so grateful to for promoting our show on a weekly basis. Today, I'm very thrilled to have a gentleman on this show who I have known about for a long time and only had the chance to meet quite recently, and that is sculptor Pablo Eduardo. So welcome, Pablo. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, this is an honor, Pablo. I know you're a very busy man, and it's taken us many months to get this together. So I am so looking forward to hearing your story, which is a very, very special one. Let me start out by reading a little bit about Pablo because he does have an incredible background and, and we all deserve to hear about um, where he's come from and what he's up to. So the sculpture of Pablo Eduardo, a native of Bolivia, but living here in the North Shore uh, for over 20 years, embraces his Spanish American heritage while marrying decades of training with int the intimate understanding of his craft. His works capture a snapshot of artistic metamorphosis as it simultaneously celebrates rhythm, emotion, texture, and tension. So keep that in mind as we go through his works later in the show. His distinctive style creates compelling pieces of contemporary art and its Baroque influences conver converse with the past. He deftly captures balance and precise movement, both physically and emotionally, to reveal a transcendent artistic experience for the viewer. I'm going to personally add that when you see his work, you're going to be transported to the last trip you had to the European continent or South America. It's quite, quite spectacular. Eduardo intended the School of, uh, of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Tufts in 1994. As an undergraduate, he learned about the body's potential for artistic manifestation, honed his understanding of human form by studying anatomy at Tufts University School of Medicine. Today, he unifies the disciplines of art and anatomy with an intimate, se intimate sense of natural dynamism in each sculpture, elegantly deconstructing his subjects and then resurrecting them in bronze. For almost 30 years, Eduardo has been a significant contributor to public art in the United States and internationally. Although he has a vast collection of public works in the Republic of Bolivia, his foremost collection of public art is right here in the United States. Among his recent notable North American installations is the Boston Marathon Bombing Memorial and the Tremere Square in Cambridge. There's also a 10 foot interactive bronze sculpture of former mayor Kevin White, prominently featured in Faneuil Hall and his 15 foot St. Ignatius of Loyola at Boston College, which celebrates a harmonious marriage between aesthetic and spiritual renewal. Eduardo was chosen to sculpt Cesar Chavez as the first monument to his Hispanic person to be installed at the University of Texas at Austin on the campus. And his commission for the civil rights leader sculpture, Ed Water, reflected something quite poignant. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to sculpt the journey of one of my personal heroes. When I was growing up as an exile, my family looked up to him as an example of tenacity and resilience. This concept of adaptability and innovation had a direct impact on my own creative revolution. It has been the cornerstone of my artistic approach. Pablo Studios here in West Gloucester and can be visited by appointment only. 
um, if you're lucky enough to find him there, right? <laughs> He's a busy man. So I want to get started here, um, Pablo, by uh, really getting you to share all the details behind uh, that wonderful bio that I just read. So thank you again for that, for your background. Thank, Let's, thank you. Why don't you uh, just kind of go back to the beginning in terms of your personal background that will help us understand you as, as both a person and an artist, because I think they're they're really intertwined. And I know you have a big world, um, even bigger than, than just your art world to share with us, so. Well, I, I from in the beginning, I, 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 you can say of our journey to this country, my family, my dad was exiled. So we came kind of in a hurry. Uh, there was a, a coup and there was a lot of violence and my father was kidnapped and his life was threatened. And uh, my mother, though as brave a woman as she was, she did not like to live uh, under these conditions. And, um, and since uh, I, I <laughs> Latin America is actually a matriarchal society, you know, uh, and so we came here. Um, my father worked in Washington for four years and then in New York for another four years and then they went back. And we stayed here in college and, um, uh, and then we kind of went back and forth and mm. then I had children and so I stayed here uh, in Gloucester. So, um, you know, once you have kids, it's kind of hard to, you have to raise them, right? Uh, Mm. Yeah. Okay. W were your parents, so they were able to go back to Bolivia. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay. Oh, that's great. Did they pick up on their careers there, their work there after? Yeah. My father went back to government and to being, uh, to doing what he loved. Um, mm. yeah. That's but great. It, and it and your mom? Uh, my mom too. My mom, um, my mom too. My mom actually stayed here for about a year and a half or something uh, when my dad went back so that we could finish college. Mm. He could uh, pay for it. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah and that's the, the one thing my parents gave us was all, all three of us um, was the best education that they could bring. Um, so um, that was very important for them. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I imagine you're doing the same with your own family. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I mean, you have. <laughs> and you have many other interests too. I mean, we will get into all of your artistic interests, but what are some of your other passions that drive you uh, today that keep you balanced, I guess, when you're yeah. spending all these hours I, in the studio? Well, first and foremost, I, 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 I would say I'm a father. I, I raised two girls. Um, and I think that that drove everything from the beginning, right? To to create an environment for them. Uh, uh, so we bought a, a large piece of land and we um, built different buildings with studios in our in our home. In it, and the the idea was always to not have to have one person raise a child and another go to work, but just to have the kids run around and go back and forth between the buildings and, and that's how they grew up and that to us was a little bit liberating and and that also forced us to create with them in mind um, environments that we thought were beautiful right so that we can also work in a, in a nice environment and and always be part of that environment and be caretakers of that environment. Um, and that I think is the, the fundamental thing that, that we maintain. And in, in our art, I think is more a reflection of that than, 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 than that of, of the art, right? That, that mm -hmm. I, I like to make uh, environments that are, that are, that are nice. Um, mm -hmm restful that are that allow you to 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 pulse a little bit um, uh. well I think um 
when we get a chance to show the video in a little bit, that will be very obvious to everyone that gets to see what your studio and it's almost its own campus, um, you know, feels like. And I think you're, you're, yes. way, you're way ahead of your time. Yeah. <laughs> because now we're all working in our home environments. So it's good. It's good that you created one that has all that, all that balance built in. Yeah. But before we go there, I, I do want to talk to you about your creative path, um, you know, because be, long before you formalized your art education, I know that you were creating in your early years um, and you had different creative explorations, you know, prior to your formal education. In the end, how did you choose sculpture as your medium? I so when we were little, my, my mom and her sister and a lot of my family are, are, are artists. Uh, and my mom did a lot of ceramics when we were growing up. And so we always had clay and we always had, um, you know, we, we were always doing art in something or another, joining my mom or, or whatever. Um, but I actually wanted to be a painter because I, I thought I wanted to raise the level a little bit, but I, I, I couldn't paint uh, at all. <laughs> I, I, I try a lot um, and I love color and I try to introduce as much color as I can to sculpture and to the environment that the sculpture lives in. And we do, um, we do do stained glass a little bit and I love it when we do because when we have the opportunity because then then it's all about color. Mm. But, um, so at some point in art school I, I took a, a sculpture class and I thought oh this is really familiar um, and I kind of just went you know like a ratatouille back into my childhood. <laughs> Clay and I have uh, I have a relationship to clay since I was, since I can remember. So um, it's great. And, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that definitely explains it. If you were growing up with clay, I grew, I grew up with Play-Doh, but uh, it didn't, didn't seem to end up with me being a sculptor. So. Well, no, we, we always, there was always clay in my mom, <laughs> clay. And we yeah. went to my aunt's house and there was clay and uh, you know, there was clay, a, a lot of clay. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's great, Pablo. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to take a moment to now show the video of your studio, because I think that helps sort of lay out that really the vastness of the types of projects that you take on. Just to illustrate, uh, my assistant did it the other day, and just to illustrate that we, we and, and all the assistants here and everyone that's ever worked here, we, we always take um, part in uh, taking care of the gardens too. We all garden and we all you know, do all these things because I, I, it's an, uh, it's an important part of, you know, to, to, to get on your knees and, and to dig um, mm -hmm. very prime, primal and, and important, I think. Um, and, and the result is, is beauty <laughs> and birds and butterflies and all those things, you know, so. And you do have some, some very talented assistants working with you. You may want to just mention yeah. it briefly because I did get a chance to beat some of them at your studio. And it's nice to know you do have a team there. Yeah, we, I, I guess for the last 20 years or more, we take on students uh, that, that do internships. Um, they're, they're all apprentices in, in some way. Uh, that's the model we, we run. Um, and we give them a very small stipend, but they, they learn as they go. And, and we do everything, um, which I think is important. I, I didn't have any of that when I was in school. Um, you know, the, we had to find out how, how you go about getting commissions, how you go about... Uh, um selling your art doing this that um but they get a little bit of a of a thing and most of all there you, you show them that there is nothing to be afraid right you have to you can figure out anything 
And sometimes we work on something for a year and it's important to, to not despair at the, uh, at the amount of work that has to go into something, you know. A lot of people say, oh, screw this. I'm not going to work on a year for mm -hmm. a year this, and get paid so little. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's a that's a wonderful opportunity. It really is. And not not many artists really have the ability to do that, either the space, um, you know, or yeah. the resources to have, you know, a, a true apprenticeship program. It's something very precious. So, yeah, and, and, it's know, great. Think, um, it's and we have very talented people here. Nicola Russell, who did the video. Um, Uh, Carolyn CV right now um, in Jen Greek, uh, uh, Liam Anastasia Murphy worked here for a little bit, uh, Winston Diodario. <laughs> I don't know. Great. There are different people in, in mm -hmm. Cape Ann that are now, you know, artists and craftsmen in, in, uh, in their own right. In, 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 yeah. In Fantastic. The You're seeding the, seeding the next generation. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a good time we have here. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. So uh, let's talk about your influences. Um, we, there's mentors, um, other artists, educators, spiritual leaders, given that your work is so ecumenical in nature. Um, what, who can you think of that kind of helped you get to where you are today that you might want to mention? And, and while you're doing that, we're actually going to show the, the church facade because I think that's... Um, Certainly one of the first, you said one of the earlier pieces that you worked on, right? You said you were yeah, 25 I, when, you, when you did that? When we started that church, 25 or 20, 25, when we finished them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was young. I worked on it with my brother who had just graduated also from architectural school. In, um, and where uh, is that? that? In La Paz. In La Paz. Okay. Yeah, um, we had a very courageous priest who trusted us and saw that we could do something fun and special and different maybe um and it was our the beginning actually of a of a long thing um it wasn't the first thing we've done but it was the first major thing i think we've done and you can still see it today and it, it's fun to go back to la paz and, and to visit the church and it's become a popular place for for people to marry in the facade and they take pictures and, and whatever but The ecum ecumenical question is, I, I, I like doing religious work um, because I like to read about the religious people that I work on. <laughs> I don't know right. Those, right. That, that, I, that, I, that I work. That you're just it's, displaying in your work. Yeah, right? so like whenever we, we get commissioned to do something like a saint or, or, or even not a saint, whoever, um, we try to do as much research as we can mm -hmm. um, into that person so that we you become a little bit of a you know like if you were acting and you you were doing a role and then so you read about it and you kind of imagine what it was like to be mm -hmm. this person or that person and to me so far the lives of the saints are very interesting particularly because it happened so long ago and it transports you to a different time Mm -hmm. Excellent. A, a time when there was a, I don't know, a magic and <laughs> people were levitating and things like this, but now we can't. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe we just had bigger imaginations. <laughs> yeah. right? Whatever it was, I mean, yeah. their, rea their reality was clearly right, clear clearly different. Um, yes, it was. Any other outside influences on your work? Any other yeah, I mean, I had a lot of influences. My my family, my my father was a, was a really deep thinker, and mm. he he always influences us. Um, we had professors, um, mm. artists, of course, someone like Michelangelo. That's like the person you discover as a young as a young student, and you're always blown away. Um, and all the way through to Giacometti or whatever the, mm -hmm. the you. Sculpture is a little bit like like music. When you are a violinist, you you're more of an interpretist, right? Than 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 an originator or something like that. And I view sculpture in the same fashion. 
there's a point in time when you have enough skill that you can make it your own and, and that's when you become yourself i guess mm -hmm. but that's a that takes a long time to mm -hmm. but you are in you you are in a part of a particular tradition right um, okay. it, it's not like you are uh, and I belong to that tradition um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not necessarily by choice but so it's very it's not like I yeah I, I'm, I'm doing everything I just do my thing yeah true but I think it's good segue into the next question which was really you know I did have a chance to read your exquisite um, catalog the book which has, I have to say, um, so much information about your, uh, how you're inspired and, and, and each of the pieces that you've worked on over the years. And you've really um, chosen a much more challenging um, sculptural, as you said, it's a, it's a certain direction that, you know, the tradition that you, you had to go and you didn't have to do that. I mean, there's sculptors no. who right down the street from you who, are working in much more abstract ways. Um, yeah. And so I'm curious um, to get to where you are today, what were some of the things that you had to go through either apprenticeships or other training? Because uh, to me, it's hard to imagine just jumping out of art school into right. doing a commission for a church. That sounds, that sounds huge. Well, I never had an apprenticeship, but you do have to be... I guess I, I well the first of all I I I went to medical school to learn because in like a pianist you 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 have to have a good piano mm -hmm. <laughs> have a, a a good knowledge of anatomy so I went to medical school and I studied biology which is the muscles and the tendons and all that stuff and I dissected a couple of cadavers and that that already was a game changer for. Uh, for me, um, I went to an incredible university, Tufts, um, who gave me an incredible education. I mean, it was kind of lucky that I was there at the time when they decided that they wanted to do all this stuff mm -hmm. for somebody. Um, and, um, and apart from the know-how of these things, that you also have to have a... a, a a context of history, of theology, of all these things that you're working with in, in your own take on those things too. Mm -hmm. So you be well read, you have to be well, um, yeah. I don't know, you know, um, my, my father was a philosopher, so we always had yeah. questions on the table, how, you know, what, uh, how do you approach this thing? How it, it's just like you interpret things differently, but yeah. you have history to to look up to. Sometimes you, um, we're, you know, we're working on a sculpture right now for Boston College, um, and we're doing um, a whole plan for the School of Theology, and it's of Saint Teresa de Avila. Mm. And, and you look at the other sculptors that have done Teresa de Avila, and of course, it's Bernini's The Ecstasy of Saint Teresa. And, there's no way you can better that. So you have to find a different path, a different way to say something. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you go to the opera and, and you see, uh, you know, 50 different people uh, yeah. do Vivaldi, right? And it's yeah. like, uh, and sometimes they're so good that you are very moved and sometimes they're, they're not. <laughs> so <laughs> we try, uh, I don't know, we're always successful, but that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. I, and it's interesting because um, you're kind of in your, maybe at the apex in a sense of the career that you um, set out to and all the things you set out to do, and you still have a long way to go in terms of your work as an artist. But there was some um, discussion in the book about making this kind of purposeful shift to be sure that you actually secure your own sort of place in his in in sort of as an artist in the world of art and how you would like to be thought of and I guess it's really this blend of classical training and with a tip of the hat I'll say toward the contemporary thinking so maybe you could just expand on that a little bit because this is something that you obviously consciously especially with your 
philosophy background, you made a pivot in there. So I just want to make sure we understand what that was. Yeah, more than classical, I would say I am Baroque, but that's because where I'm from is a, is a Baroque city. We, you know, La Paz is, is Baroque. We, our laws are Baroque. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Baroque. Everything is Baroque. So it's a, it's not so much a conscious thing, but it's just a, that's how I grew up. And that's the, mm -hmm. although I grew up here as well in a very contemporary setting, um, with all the contemporary things and I am a contemporary person, so I cannot, you know, um, but you, you always pull on, on, you know, I am the product, not just of, of me in the last 50 years of me, but I'm also the product of my, my father and, and his father and his father and my mother and their mother and their mother. And they're, those are all very, um, much alive in me and uh, you know um, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother when I was back after college in Bolivia and, um, and her siblings and their world was so different right uh, my, my grandmother never uh, learned to drive for instance um, wow wow um, and uh, you know she remembers uh, she can ride very well horses. <laughs> <laughs> she can't drive. Um, and same thing with my uncles and stuff. And they, their world changed so suddenly for them because they weren't ready mm. in, in, in the pace of their life. It's just more of recognizing in my career, maybe where my influences, having mm -hmm. a little time to think about yeah. where certain influences come yeah. from. Um, but in a sense the Baroque work you're doing is not typical of what you would see most sculpt sculptors attempt even in this country. Cause I mean, we don't have that tradition, but I don't know where, you know, I don't know how many churches, for example, are being built today. And if I go to a, a lot of the newer churches that I've seen would their, their sculpture is very contemporary. It's very modern. It's very mm. edgy. It's not at all the kind of European tradition that, you know, you would expect in a traditional uh, yeah. church. Well, I mean, I, I, I would say <laughs> my sculpt or the work that we do is, is very modern um, mm. and, and edgy. <laughs> okay, but, so there you go. It's, it's all in perspective. My, my, my perspective, right? Um, yeah. The, the one thing that, that, all my good professors and, and my father, who was a big influence on me, he always said, you know, don't let anyone tell you what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. You do what you do and, yeah. and apologize later, right? But so we don't yeah. have to be imagining this. We're going to flash up a picture of yeah. um, the work of St. Ignatius Flaiola. Um, and I think one of the things you talked about was... Um, a desire for the art to speak for itself. And I asked you to think about which piece of art speaks the loudest. That's a tough question. It's like asking you, which is your, you know, your favorite pet that you ever had, right? It's just, yeah. there's no right answer here, but, I, but you did mention that you were particularly proud of St. Ignatius. So why don't you speak to that for a moment? I'm particularly thankful to St. Ignatius. <laughs> okay. St. <laughs> Ign Ignatius was, I think for me, um, that was almost 20 years ago also, the, the, a, a, a big thing in my career and a, and a big thing in my theology and in, in, a, in a big um, thing in so many ways. I, I spent... Um, close to three years working on that in the studio. And I was going through a very tough time um, personally. You know, it's like one of those things where you have ex existential things like, I, is this all that there is? You know, am mm. I just gonna work here and until I die? Uh, I'm just gonna raise the kids. I'm gonna be with my wife. Uh, I'm going to uh, do all these things. And St. Ignatius, I had to read all of Saint Ignatius because that's who I was doing. And 
he showed me that um, work is the best thing <laughs> that you can do. He, he reinforced all the things about working really hard and and being in the work being a, a a form of prayer, the, the work being a form of meditation, the form being uh, the work being a, a, f- a form of gratitude. Um, mm. In in the, the work being uh, a reason for you to be here, right? Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, we are here to work and make things better than we left them, I guess, because otherwise we just consume and consume and consume and, and, and we would be like locust, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, so St. Ignatius for me was, was that, and I still do, and I still do visit the sculpture. Um, and where is that sculpture? At Boston College, yeah. At Boston College, okay. I think yeah. we all need to visit this sculpture. Yeah. And it's become very iconic for them. Um, wow. And both my kids have gone to Boston College and wow. it's nice for them, you know, they say we, because they actually take very much um, this sculpture to be theirs too. Because when they were little, they were always on the, on the ladder and mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. Know, pushing clay and, and things right. like that. Um, Right. But it's nice. Um, so that's I, I. That's why I think that was my. You know, it, of all the curves that I had, that was a really big one to be yeah. on top. Of, um, yeah. It's good that, that that sculpture found a good a, a good home in your studio, a place, yeah. to, a place to live and and evolve. Yeah, it was it was tough when we finish. Yeah. When we usually finish the sculpture, we destroy it and then yeah. we. You know, all the material goes away, and, and it's an empty yeah. thing. It, it was like it was it was lonely. <laughs> you know, we aren't getting into process in this call, but um, maybe you could at least comment a little bit on, like the I guess what would be the shortest time that you could have possibly created any of the pieces you've done, and what was the longest. Because there is a big process in there. Yeah, I think Saint Ignatius was one of the longest ones, mm-hmm. and some of the shortest one ones. We we have done work for um, certain places. We did a, a couple. Of, uh, we did a bunch of reliefs for a cathedral in in California, and mm. they had a very limited amount of time that they could give me when they hired me. They said you need to have these things done by by this time and you know can can you do it um so it becomes something else too it it, yeah. it becomes uh, a, a kind of exercise of this is what i can produce in, in, in a given time um, yeah. the fun part about my job is that everything is always different um and everything you know otherwise you would be doing the same thing over and over again and, and after 30 40 years <laughs> yeah you know do it anymore but so the every project is different every project has requires different things from you um you know it takes its own life and it, and yeah. it asks in, in, from what i saw in your studio you do integrate a lot of different materials into your process i mean you aren't working just with clay no we work with uh metal we work with uh stone um we got into web glass um right uh, we we started doing a couple of very intricate little sculptures made out of out of um, uh, bronze with inlaid lapis lazuli. We're doing one now, two, two actually that are going to be silver. Mm. Um, so uh, it's nice because sometimes you're on the ladder all day, and then so in the evening it's nice to sit down with something little. <laughs> um, you know. A little bit of everything. Um, that's just fantastic, Pablo. So now let's, we're going to bring up a series of works and have you share with us sort of from the beginning, I asked you to share some things that were kind of distinct in terms of how they either came about as projects, um, and just the scale. And we picked a few of these to show. We're going to show the bust of Arthur Stickney, who's interesting, happens to be somebody I have met and known. Um, and also um, the, let's see here, we're going to do St. Thomas More. 
And then we're going to end with the Boston Marathon bombing sculpture, which is certainly quite different than anything else we will have seen yeah. at this point. So let's um, let's start with the bust and, and talk about, you know, kind of how that came about and and how that sort of stands out in terms of the portfolio. Portraits for a long time, and, and it's still, you know, for me, sometimes my bread and, and water, as they say, because... Um, you get sitters or people that want their portrait done all the time. So um, sometimes they're dead, but um, the best are when they're alive and they come into the studio and they sit down for, I don't know, what, whatever the, the portrait requires, right? Uh, and, and it's nice because you get to know the person, you get to, um, it's like being, with a psychiatrist, but it's it's a two way thing. Um, both people have to open to each other, and um, you start to know to depict them. I I like to think of it more from their inside out, right? Until mm -hmm. the, the, the thing. I mean, Mr. Stigney is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a self made man, which I love. Um, mm -hmm. um, in just a good person, um, strong. I just wanted to show you as, as something that that I like to do a lot because it's I I I get to meet a lot of interesting people that way. A lot of our sculptures are portraits in themselves, but not in the portrait um, uh, form form or yeah. yeah but you know they're, they're yeah. huge or, or whatever. So you so, know because you're gonna look at their face from. 30 feet or 20 feet, mm -hmm. you don't have to be so intimate or you have to be able to um, edit things very differently, right? Then, then something that lives in, in your office or in, in, in your living room or something, it's very intimate. And it becomes much more so uh, for the family once that individual is gone. Um, yeah. um, I, I remember my grandmother, my great grandmother, when she was a, a, a little bit senile, she would, um, you know, get into fights with 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 busts in her house. Mm. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and 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 I guess maybe to me that made an impression because, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was. That's really great. Wow. They really are living. They're living monuments. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, let's let's have a little bit of a discussion um, next about St. Thomas More. And there's there's somebody that we um, we all know just a little bit about. Yeah, he was fascinating. Uh, we got we asked, we got asked to do this sculpture of St. Thomas More for the law school at, at Boston College, and. Um, the only thing I read of him in, in school was uh, Utopia, uh, mm. but I don't know too much more or not dwell too, too much on it. Um, I have a good friend uh, in Anisquam, actually, who Thomas More was one of his specialties at Brown. So he gave me a list of, um, uh, you know, <laughs> of, of things to read about Thomas More. And, it, it it was a very moving life. I mean, he was very dedicated to his own ideas, but um, he was very close to his daughter, which I could relate to. Um, you know, his daughter published his books uh, posthumously uh, after he had died. Uh, she wasn't supposed to be able to read or write at that time, but you know, he educated her, and, and she she printed a lot of his books afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm. And he believed in the rule of law, <laughs> which is kind of on the edge today. Um, but, you know, he said, if you're going to do battle with the devil, uh, you better, it's, it's, it would be way better for it. For, I'm just paraphrasing, but yeah. to be in a court of law where both of us can follow the same rules, right? Right, <laughs> right. Uh, we need him now. back, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> He has a lot of other controversies too. I mean, he burned a lot of people at the stake and, and he he had all these things. But I think what they wanted to show with him and what we portrayed was his strength of character. I became very close to him again. Um, and 
you can see the amount of detail we spend probably two years uh, having conversations with each other. Um, mm -hmm. I love that. I just, I love the idea of you conversing with these statues, um, you know, as they're, as they're being, as I guess, as they're coming to life. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Okay. Yeah, there, now, there is a there is a point where they there's a there's a curve, right? And until you reach the curve, it's 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 total struggle. Uh, I mean, sometimes you cry, sometimes you say this, I'll never do this. What am I doing? Blah, 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 blah. It's it's terrible. But once you reach the thing, and you they're not done yet, but you can see that they're that they're manifesting. Let's say then the down the downhill is. Is, is really nice and, and it's just adding and, and, and having fun. But that, you know, the, the first three quarters is a, is a journey. Tough. It's a journey, yeah. an uphill journey. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. Yeah. Excellent. I like that a lot, Pablo. Thank you for hearing that. Um, our last one, which I think is something that everybody in Boston uh, certainly wants to hear about is the, Marathon bombing sculpture and how you came up with that design. And, and even, I mean, you had to be competing, I imagine, with many, many other artists for this particular yeah. commission. So what do you think? Because that's very different, right? I mean, than dealing with the university. I mean, this is public art. So um, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Yeah, it was a competition. Uh, I would say... 80% of, of our things are competitions um, mm. that we that we win. Um, and I think we probably lost just as many. Um, that's another thing you have to learn is just to lose competitions, to lose, mm. uh, to be rejected all the time, right? And yep. not not take it. Um, too, not too take personal. it personally, right? Yeah. <laughs> too personal. It, it is personal. Yeah. You have to understand and you win some and then you lose some. As Arthur Stickney used to say, uh, sometimes you get the bear and sometimes the bear gets you. Um, <laughs> but um, these are the things that stick, stick with you when you spend so much time with someone. But the, the memorial, we, we won the competition. Um, and they wanted to, they, I, I imagine that they wanted something very different, right? Because it was such a different thing. It was such a atrocious thing. It was, and we had to always be in contact with the families. And, and for them, this is a total emotional thing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. their, their loved ones were murdered. And mm -hmm. so it, you had to tread extremely lightly and you had to create something that You can say something that will give them peace because there's, I don't know if there's anything that can give you peace mm -hmm. and that's it, but that's something that will, will show everything about the event and not say that, the, that there wasn't any silver lining in the, okay. in, right. in, in the product of it, that, that it showed that what happened and that what happened was bad. Um, you had to show it in, in a beautiful way, of course, but it still... So that was the, the hmm. how do you show something like that in a beautiful way? Because they, they both kind of contradict. Everything in that thing is a symbolic of something, right? The, the trees, the, the pavement, the, we, we picked stones from all different parts of Massachusetts and New England. Um, from wherever runners came, we, we, we tried to pick a stone, a granite for the materials from Boston, like brick and, and hmm. granite. Um, a glass because there was a light. Uh, the, our first design was actually a beacon, and that evolved into uh, these kind of lamps that change color. And it was it was to show the tra tragedy, the unnecessariness of that stuff, but also how we as Boston reacted to it. You know, did you have to submit this design before as part of the competition, or did you? Yeah. Just, so you actually had to think this entire thing through. Yes, you do. Most, yeah. yeah, I mean, most competitions give you right. a little bit of time to think about. What once you win, always like anything. Yeah, things will change. You, 
you get more time to evolve it and, and right. refine it and, and things mm-hmm. like that. But yeah. I think most of the time they either like where you're heading is probably the, the more most accurate way to say it. But um, the main goal, they must have given you some objectives though. And it sounds like it was to not undermine the fact that this was a tragedy, but try to put it in context of some They actually didn't. They just said, design something, um, see what you can come up with. You know the story. Um, A lot of other people came came up with very compelling things as well. Um, So I think it was hard, probably hard for for everyone. Um, Everybody had different ideas of how to portray an event like this. Um, and hopefully we did a good job in it. Um, it was a very moving experience through and through. Um, and hard too, to, uh, you, you read about these things all the time, but you, you very seldom get to meet the people who, who lost a child or who were maimed or... Right. Right. Um, and and really sit down and and yeah. and because you you there's no way around it. But yeah. it's, it's it's a reality that you have to portray. It's a thing. So it was just we call it the mark the 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 marathon markings, right? Circle, or the bombing markings, something. Okay. Um, I think every person will see that and interpret it their own way. Yeah, and I know that's always your goal. So I won't yeah. even try to read into it. No, further yeah, at and, this and, point. And, and, and it's so, not a cool symbol. And we got yeah. to work with a lot of people, a lot of art, art artists, artisans. Um, there were so many craftsmen, including ourselves, that contributed to this to this thing. It was a really, it, it was a real community effort. Um, yeah. Even here in Gloucester, I, I went to Roses one time, Rose Marine, to buy mm-hmm. bronze because they're the only people that sell bronze. Oh wow! I've been going in there for years, but they said. Yeah. Uh, I saw you on television. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, it, we're gonna give you a, a, a price because mm-hmm. we we also wanted to contribute. Uh, oh. you know, our, our piece. And nice. Everybody was really good like that. Uh, and you were in there in other times because I think you mentioned to me that you love to sail, right? So I mean, that's how you well, know yeah. this marine, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. this is. This is this is Gloucester, um, and Gloucester is the water, right? And yeah. This, um, you move here, and it just calls you, uh, and you can't help yourself. Uh, yes, so true, absolutely yeah. true. So we are getting close to uh, the end of our discussion, and so you know, when I asked you to do this interview, you were very clear that you're really not a big promoter. Obviously, um, you must get your name out there in some ways, which we know you have a, a wonderful website. People certainly know about you. But I think it would be very interesting for you to think about w- how you would like to use this discussion. Like, would you, you know, what are, in, in even engaging today, what do you hope that people will get out of this? Well, as, as you told me when I was discussing this to you, you said we, we need a record of um, who who is in Gloucester at this time and who is working here in Cape Ann and who is part of our community. And I, I think that would be my hope so mm. that they can see, because we have a very diverse community. Um, I am part of it. Gloucester is a funny place because it, there's so many tal- talented people and artists and writers and musicians. Um, you would think that at night everybody would be at the bars and, and, and mm-hmm. you know it would be, but it's very seldom that you get to meet other artists. Uh, funny stories. I, I know uh, Aidan Murray because we ha- share the same friends and we've known each other maybe 10 years and they live right down the street. And the only time I saw him was at a play in uh, uh, in Boston uh, uh, a few weekends ago. We went to see another person from Cape Ann who, who, who did, um, who Jen Greek did her customs and she was doing about a play about adopting a child. That was very funny. 
Too fat for China. Yes. Too fat for China. Yes, you know, I went in and saw that myself. Yep. And uh, I ran into Aiden and, and, and we said, you know, <laughs> we live right down the street and we'd never get a chance to see each other. Yep. So it's, it's fun unless you have connections or unless you have things to whatever. Um, you have your own little circle of friends and then you work hard and that's it. Nose to the grindstone. Nose to the grindstone. <laughs> Nose to the grindstone. In your case, very true, right? Yeah. So we're going to have to uh, wrap up, but before we do, we will show your website, which is the best way to find out more about Pablo Eduardo, and um, sit for your portrait if you're at that particular stage where you'd like to have a wonderful bust. Uh, I think it's uh, your work is phenomenal, Pablo. Thank I feel, you. I feel like we've only scratched the tip of the iceberg, and I, yeah. I really do hope. Um, despite the fact that you're not a promoter, that some people that didn't know you will have a chance to get to know you through this interview. That would be nice. Thank okay. you, Mary. That's great. So thank you to our viewers for um, sharing this time with us today with Cape Ann Artwaves. Thank you again to all of our sponsors. And you can view Cape Ann Artwaves on Channel 12 and also at the 1623 Studios uh, YouTube and, uh, playlist for Cape Ann Art Waves. And look for us on Facebook and on Twitter and in the weekly Sea Arts eBlast. Thank you again to Pablo and to our audience. We'll see you soon. Thank you.